We've got United States and uh, Spain, Saudi Arabia, Italy. Wow, that's the world. Uh, Poland, Serbia, Cyprus. So good to have you. Let me know if I lose audio in case I don't pay attention because my Mac has been acting up. And Sweden, of course, uh, Mexico. Wow, what a diverse group of attendees. Did I miss a country? Venezuela, India, Brazil. You must be really excited in Brazil. The whole world is with you. So uh, yay for uh, the World Cup and Canada. Hello. Uh, and I think people will be coming in. Somebody wrote something. Oh, Norway. <laughs> Hello, Norway. Good to see you. All right. So let's get started. Our speaker was kind enough to add the uh, list of presenters. And our next presenter is right here. Um, and Ebba, I can't pronounce your last name, I'm sorry, is from Sweden. She is very, very passionate about open education and open educational resources. If you're not familiar with that, you will learn about it very soon. That means sharing and caring and caring and sharing as a way to show your appreciation. And because we are all here on earth to learn together, why not share and make our learning experiences uh, positive and enjoyable and a pleasure because that's what life is all about. So, oh, I see Dr. Remish is here as well. Good to see you. And did I miss anyone else? All right, so welcome everybody. And uh, let's get started with the presentation. I don't want to take any more of your time. Feel free to use the chat for questions or general chats. I see our speaker came in as uh, a private person. So let me give you uh, full rights as the presenter. If you don't know, presenters can now come in with a co-presenter link and go straight into class the way Cheryl did yesterday. There's no need to go through uh, anything. And it doesn't take uh, time on the system. So hello, good afternoon, good morning, good night, whatever it happens to be. And um, I'm going to let you continue and provide us with learning. I don't hear you, which... Everybody here, um, Eba? Am I the only one not hearing? Oh, I see thumbs down. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, we'll, I'll pause the recording so that um, we can see what's going on. I don't know if you're on a Mac, but I noticed that lately my sound goes down to zero. So could you check, first of all, your WizIQ settings, Ebba, to make sure that the, uh, the bar is not on zero? Um, if you don't see... Uh, the scale at least halfway through it means that it's gone down. Oh, you're on a PC. Okay, if you're on a PC, it's a lot simpler. Just go into the WizIQ settings right there where there's a wrench above your uh, webcam. Or you know what I can do? I can do something even better than that. I can give you, oh, you just left. I can give, I was going to give um, Ebba the link to the presenter, the presenter's link so she can come in directly. Um, let's see if I can do that uh, by, through a private message. All right, so how is everybody? You feel free to use the chat. I know you've had a lot of questions about different things. I can answer basically that if you want to get your box ticked off, you really have to go through all the pages of the book of the book tasks, you have to follow the arrows, one arrow, two, there are lots of arrows until you get to the end. How do you know that you get to the end of all the arrows in the book? Because the last arrow goes up and it goes to the left. And that's when you know you've reached it. And then you'll notice that uh, it's ticked off. Ebba, I've added a link to, um, there we go. I've added a link 
to your live session if you have any more problems in a private chat there. Um, I don't think you have audio yet. I don't think you have to go out. What you need to do is you need to go into the WizIQ settings right here. Uh, there's a device, it says device settings above your head, and there's a wrench. You go into the wrench and make sure that um, you can test your system right here. You don't have to leave the classroom. Another question that Tom asked that other people have asked, uh, not everyone, is about the um, the reflections. You don't have to upload anything. I just answered that. Um, it's online. In other words, you write your reflections directly on... Oh, there, we hear you. Excellent. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. Oh, fine. That's it. Is yes. It, is it okay? Perfect. Thank you. Hello. Hello, everybody. You like me to start, Alex? Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm so happy and honored to be here uh, to talk to you in the fourth uh, Moodle MOOC uh, course. Can you hear me? I think this is my oh, fine. First, uh, time with you, is, Alex. is it okay? So hello, hello everybody. Do you like me to start, Ale? And I'm very happy to be here to talk get to you about uh, beyond the MOOCs. Okay. Because now we have lived with them. Um, really yeah. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm so happy and honored to be here uh, so to talk to you in the, in the fourth uh, Moodle MOOC uh, course. I think this is my fourth uh, time with you, Nelly. We did the blog uh, spring session uh, earlier in spring, and then we have done. I have done uh, two other uh, Moodle MOOC courses with you, and I'm very happy to be here to talk get to you about uh, beyond the MOOCs. Because now we have lived with them, for really changed a lot in educational, in education and educational systems. And I'm so happy that there are so many people from um, more or less all over the world. So welcome all of you, and please uh, feel free to uh, write uh, questions, uh, um, discussions points, etc., in the chat, and we will. Uh, I will try to follow up. Uh, I used to show this uh, slide. This is a presentation about myself. The title is uh, Beyond the MOOCs, and I'm from Lund University in Sweden. And this is the main building of the university. It's a rather old university. We are celebrating in 2016 our 350 years anniversary. And uh, next autumn, we are starting to have uh, three books from my university. Uh, I used to show this uh, slide. This is a presentation about myself. Uh, I work at Lund University uh, as a project manager. I took my PhD in Olo in Finland. Um, I was recently, last week actually, um, appointed to Eden Fellow for 2014. And that means that um, they think I have done something uh, education and e-learning and distance education in Europe and I'm very very happy and proud for that and next week we will uh, have the conference in Zagreb and um, the ceremony for the award will be, be there and I saw that uh, Morten Flate Polson is um, joining us and he is the former president also for, for Eden so nice that you're here Morten uh, I also work with um, some other uh, European organizations like uh, FQL and the IDTU about uh, open education and online learning. I'm also certified head reviewer for FQL and Unique, uh, Open Up, um, Open Up Ed, and ECB Check. Uh, those all are um, uh, models for uh, accreditation and certification for online learning. But it's not actually what I would like to talk to you about today, because today it's about the MOOCs and beyond the MOOCs. But this is a bit uh, of my background. I mentioned also uh, Campus NUA. Uh, last week we had a very, very nice meeting with Campus NUA. That is a Nordic uh, as, uh, initiative about open education. And the Morten Flaut again is um, uh, the CEO for Campus NUA. 
from all universities. Uh, I also work very, very much with the open education resources, both in the Nordic countries but also in the Baltic also countries. So your oldest daughter's name is uh, Noah. Nice. This is totally different from this, uh, it's a nice name. Um, I did my PhD on um, benchmarking e-learning in higher education, and I said um, from all university in um, Finland, and I did it uh, also to distance because I'm living as I'm learning. And I also took some uh, initiatives, yes, some uh, perspectives from the yeah. serendipity and the right zone perspectives because I think we're talking about open education. We need to have this kind of approach because this is totally different from this uh, hierarchical, hierarchical or uh, linear system which uh, most of education are built in. The European Commission came with the initiative that. Now, let know something happened that uh, continue anyway. Okay. Do you see me and hear me again? And why did I do that? Because yeah. it says that uh, you need to be more competitive, both for education but also in the at labor market. So, why it is important to talk about uh, behind or behind the milks? Uh, in Europe, um, last year, uh, the European Commission came with the initiative about. Um, opening up education to boost innovation uh, in schools and, educa and in education. And why did they do did, did that? Because that uh, you need to be more com competitive, both for education but also in the, at the labor market. So that's the reason why I have set up a, a lot of some goal sets about uh, what does the European Commission mean about opening up education. And I will just say some very short about that. Uh, they mean that opening up education means bringing the digital revolution into education and that digital te technologies allow all individuals to learn anywhere, anytime, to any device with the support of anyone. And that's the reason why it's so important to talk about what is happening with the MOOCs and what is happening Join the MOOCs, what comes out of all this. And the main message from Xavier Bonnet from the European Commission um, is that. Uh, In Europe, there has now already been two um, MOOC summits where stakeholders um, from Europe but also worldwide have been, uh, been gathering together, talking about experiences about MOOCs, uh, talking about um, policies, talking about accreditation, certification, talking about research, talking about business models. And the main message from Xavier Bonnet from the European Commission um, is that um, he said that um, it's not relevant to ask what can MOOCs do. The relevant question is rather to ask what should MOOCs do. And how can MOOCs uh, be brought into uh, opening up education and the consequences of that? And at this summit, summit which were uh, held in uh, Lausanne in uh, February, the one of the conclusions were that uh, MOOCs will affect higher education and that traditional educational map must be redrawn drawn with other structures, other, other kind of pedagogy, um, other kind of organization and infrastructure and management. And um, maybe uh, a common word for that is uh, globalization. We need to uh, organize education both at national, local level, but also at international level. So globalization is the word. <laughs> I'm sure that um, most of you are familiar with the, the four letters in the MOOC concept. M stands for massive, the first O for open, the second one for online, and the fourth one for course. And it was Stephen Downs and, um, and George, uh, George Siemens who held the first uh, courses, and it was David Cormer who, who coined 
concept of MOOC. And they also say that each of those letters are negotiable. Um, and that is that is true in many ways, but it's also it's true that you need to take into consideration all the letters. Uh, actually, the first MOOCs uh, were, like we are called, the C MOOCs, uh, like Connectivist MOOCs, and the participants built, built the course together. It was built to RSS flow with social media. Uh, the participants uh, decided themselves about um, the content and the course goals and uh, examinations, etc. Uh, but more and more, uh, what we see now is more the X MOOCs, which are provided by the providers, and they are structured by the universities. <laughs> but as you see in this slide, um, the M stands for um, that is massive. There are often often uh, hundred thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand uh, participants. Uh, the first O stands for open registration. Everyone who registered, uh, they are enrolled. But it's also about open content and that they are free of charge. And that means uh, gratis, as we say in Swedish, which has been uh, an international word. Uh, and also O stands for affordable. Uh, the second O stands for uh, that is online and often real-time interaction, but also both uh, synchronous and asynchronous, of course. Uh, the C stands for that it's um, it's course. It often has a start date and an end date. Um, the role of the instructor differ. Sometimes they are rather traditional. There are some videos and there are teachers uh, talking about the topic. Uh, and some courses are very interactive and built on the participants' um, uh, knowledge experiences and what they would like to do. Uh, the, most, uh, the most books are not with credits. You all forget the badge. And this is really um, the new things with with courses and with education to have courses which are not uh, per automatically given credits. So I will come back later on to that because that is really between the MOOCs. What should we do with that? Um, I just am checking in the in the chat uh, if there was something which I should pick up. Yeah, some said uh, Creative Commons, and uh, that's right. Most of the MOOCs, um, especially the C MOOCs, are built with the Creative Commons licensing. Uh, actually, most many of the X MOOCs courses are built on copyright, uh, unfortunately. So again, the dimensions of MOOCs are about openness, they are scalable, they use, the, they use multimedia, it's a lot of communication and collaboration, and the learners can take their own pathways. Um, the certification is a um, huge variation about that, and it's also the courses are meant for diversity of participants. That means both in culture, gender, background, countries, languages, etc. So you have a very uh, diverse uh, audience for those courses. Uh, in Europe, um, we have catch up uh, quite uh, strong uh, with the with the number of MOOCs uh, the last year. So I think we have a uh, sorry. <laughs> I think we have now. Um, around uh, nearly 600 uh, MOOCs in Europe, and that is half of the amount uh, coming from the States. Uh, in Sweden, we have uh, so far, um, it says four on the map, but we will have um, actually six, in uh, two from Karolinska Institute in Sweden and uh, three from the University. And also Chalmers uh, in, in Sweden are catching up in uh, 2015, and also Uppsala University. So you can see that in the lower uh, pictures, um, Europe has uh, raised um, very quick in the offering uh, and distribution of MOOCs.
Uh, it was MIT who launched the first MOOCs, and uh, they did it um, because they wanted to uh, let more people take part uh, of their courses and their the content and the research, but also to attract uh, other students uh, taking their ordinary math courses, for example. <coughs> and actually, it is uh, today, uh, like the most people who are taking MOOCs are people who already have some kind of degree. So I think it's people like uh, us here in the audience. Uh, we often see also that um, uh, a MOOC used to be around uh, four to ten weeks, and there is a very high activity during the first uh, one or two weeks. And then as is seen in this um, slide, um, the interactivity and the participation uh, really decrease. Uh, some people say that uh, that is um, the bad thing with MOOCs. But on the other hand, I don't think it's that bad because if 10,000 people are participating in a MOOC and um, 1,000 of them fulfill the course, that means that um, 1,000 people get education from high qualified universities instead of having no education at all. And uh, I think that is very, very good. But some people think it's a failure of the books. But it depends on which, which uh, uh, approach you have. Is the glass uh, half full or is it uh, half empty? I think you achieve a lot if people get access to the to education from uh, uh, well-known, famous universities. Because, because education is never bit to bear. Uh, we also see that uh, very many um, MOOC participants are just observers. They would just like to have the content. They are, have never intended to take any degree or to take any exam. And they're not at all interested in the batch or the credits or whatever you get. And we also see that uh, a lot of people uh, maybe start with one MOOC and then they end up in another MOOC and maybe they fulfill that or maybe they jump to another one. Uh, so uh, that is also, in, is that a failure or is it a success? Maybe it's success if you try different kind of things and then suddenly you find something which suits you and then you stay with that. So many MOOCs are like appetizer for education. And maybe also many people can take a MOOC and uh, then they see that, oh, it's not that really hard as I thought to study at university. Maybe I can take another course and maybe I can try again, try another subject, try, try another uh, course. And I think that is uh, also a success. Um, like uh, Stephen Downs say that uh, going into to an, an or to be enrolled in an ordinary course, course is to like to read the book. You start from page one and end in page whatever it is. But um, taking part in MOOCs is more like reading a newspaper. You go for the headings and for the bold text and uh, find something here, find something there, and put things together that you are interested in. And also maybe when we design MOOCs, uh, it should be like that, uh, this, and the, that we are aware of that, you, that we can't organize the MOOCs like it was in the old time when we have uh, this linear courses starting from point one, ending in another point. And all participants go the same way. Um, we also have to to be aware of uh, what kind of openness is it in the MOOCs. Uh, we talked earlier about Creative Commons, and um, we all we all know uh, that uh, with Creative Commons we have six different kind of uh, licensing. And we have everything from uh, copyright, which is the hardest uh, one. You can't do anything uh, with that. You can just uh, you can just ask if you can use material which other people have uh, produced, and then you can have everything to which is public domain and um, with a CC BY, which is the more most liberal uh, Creative Commons. So you can say that you have uh, 50 shades of openness, and how open is a MOOC? That is really a question. And as we saw from the previous slide, uh, one of the O's stands for open. And is it really open if you have copyrighted material? I 
I can't really see that uh, so many Muslim of them have uh, really been aware of the the white standards. And the white standards is uh, about accessibility for people who are disabled in some other way. Um, another thing we have to take into account is uh, about um, accessibility and to use the white standards. Uh, and uh, I've done many, quite many courses myself, uh, some 30 during the last year. And um, I can't really see that uh, so many MOOCs of them have uh, really been aware of the, the Y standards. And the Y standards is uh, about accessibility for people who are disabled in one or another way. And uh, also the MOOCs are pretty good for people who maybe don't can come to universities. Um, due to any circumstances, if they are sick, uh, disabled, or have some problems with anything. Uh, then we also have to uh, take learning design into consideration. And if we really mean that the uh, individual should be in the center uh, to build on uh, the 21st century learning networks, which is very much built on social media, uh, we have to design the MOOCs in different ways. Uh, many MOOCs today, especially this, the X mentioned before, uh, are very much built on uh, lectures, videos, um, uh, quite often rather boring, <laughs> honestly to say. Uh, but how can we really use, um, uh, take advantages of the social media and the um, possibilities for interactions? And we have a lot, a huge variety uh, in our palette to, to use when we design courses, when we design uh, assessment, when we attract uh, students coming to, to the courses. And especially also, when, if we really mean that uh, the learner should be in the driving seat, we really have to um, encourage and to, to um, see what what is what do the, the learners have with them, and what are the skills they need to uh, to use, and what is the, the what are the learning goals about in the course. And especially when we think about what uh, the European Commission has set up with the. Uh, Learning anytime, learning anywhere, with any device, uh, learning from anyone. Uh, then there's a lot of uh, new skills we have to think about. And those used to be called uh, 21st century skills, and that is very much about uh, digital literacy. And uh, digital literacy is not um, to be digital as such, it's very much about uh, to access and uh, critical analyze online information and to engage in safe and constructive social networking, and uh, to know how to create and share knowledge. So it's a lot about ethical uh, issues and uh, law issues, and critical thinking, and cultural uh, and social understanding uh, about collaboration. Uh, so it, it's not just about uh, the technical aspects as such, and it's very much about, of course, e-safety. Hi, Anaya. Sorry, uh, you jumped in just. Um, also, with the with the MOOCs, there has um, come this. Um, the, the concept of learning analytics has been very much used. Because now with technology, technology we can um, uh, really um, do a lot of things and, and see how people are learning, um, what kind of resources they are using, how they use the resources, etc. And there are also different kind of, of um, level of object analysis and who benefits from that. For example, with learning analytics, we can see on course level, we can see learn a lot about uh, how is social networks used uh, and what reason and who are they using who are, who are using them about uh, conceptual development 
about the discourse analysis, about intelligent curriculum. Uh, we can also learn a lot from a departmental level, how we can um, see patterns of success or failure for the learners. And then um, we can also uh, see the academic an analysis. And that is more about from the institutional perspective and regional and national and international perspective. How, uh, who is uh, uh, attending our courses, uh, for what reason, uh, how are the learning pathways and how we can also uh, in the, uh, later on uh, design the course or to, to fit better for the, for the users. And with the, this technology, with learning analytics, we can really learn a lot. But of course, we have to be very much excited uh, about the ethical aspects of it. Um, so with the um, learning analytics, we can plan and improve learning design. Uh, we can specify uh, learning delivery methods. We can realize learning delivery. Uh, we can see very much about students' engagement with learning, whether they are active, when are they more passive, uh, when do they interact, and how, what can we learn from that. We can also see about the assessment and completion. Uh, as we just said earlier, quite many participants are not really keen on uh, taking the credits or taking the certific certificates. Um, that is fine. I mean, that is not maybe the, the goal as such, but maybe we can design the course so people are more keen to to complete the course. And uh, we can learn about, a lot about the learning pathways. Uh, are any of you in the audience um, uh, discussing about learning analytics and uh, are you using it? Try to follow the chat here. Some says they are new to this. Uh, but uh, working with the learning analytics, um, that uh, requires a lot of skills and knowledge. I see, uh, Helena, you have raised a question about uh, quality. And of course, I'm coming back to that. OK, so we continue for a while. Uh, but uh, working with the learning analytics, um, that uh, requires a lot of skills and knowledge. Uh, what to do with it? And as we see in this uh, slide, there are very, very many dimensions. I will not uh, go through them all, but uh, you have the slides afterwards. You can uh, come back to it if you like. Uh, I will just uh, mention uh, some. Uh, of course, learning analytics is based on learning theory, and uh, we can um, change our pedagogical uh, and didactical um, methods and models uh, after what we learn from learning analytics. Uh, we can also uh, learn about um, how to design courses, uh, about uh, how people are connected, uh, about the web development, about uh, da data mining, uh, mining and uh, data visualization. Um, so really there is maybe a lot of new skills and knowledges which we have to add to our other pedagogical skills as academics at universities. And I'm not quite sure uh, how, um, maybe you know in your countries, but um, in my country I don't think really we, we uh, take this really into consideration at that high level as it should be. Uh, but actually, uh, I got um, a request today uh, that there will be a European standard about uh, learning analytics, and I was asked to, um, to look at that and see if it was okay or if things were missing. 
uh, for this uh, ISO standard for learning analytics. And um, maybe that is worth to catch up with in, in your countries because I think this is really a new area which has followed the MOOCs and which is really beyond uh, the discussion about MOOCs because the MOOCs is one thing and the courses as such, but there are so many consequences about it. And um, this about learning analytics is, is really a consequence. Uh, because it um, both will affect our pedagogical behavior, but also our the pedagogical consequences. Uh, so, about, uh, so we just uh, mentioned those uh, two big squares, not what is in the, really in the middle, but, but um, you can study that uh, on your own later on. But with learning analytics, uh, the pedagogical behavior and the consequences will be uh, a lot different, and we have to to uh, really take into consideration what we will do with it, if we will do something. Uh, so talking about uh, quality, I uh, saw so the question here in the in the chat. I think it was you, Helena, who raised it. Uh, um, of course, uh, quality is a very, very important uh, issue. And uh, as I'm a quality person myself and have done research on quality and online learning, this is really my topic and um, my, my really hot topic. Uh, recently, um, academic partnership was, uh, with um, uh, Sir John Daniel and Stamenka, Stamenka, sorry, I can't really pronounce her name, but she was the director for UNESCO and for uh, our Commonwealth of Learning. Uh, they launched this, um, this report, uh, A Guide to Quality in Post-Traditional Online Higher Education. And post-traditional online higher education is a new term which they have coined uh, due to this new openness because MOOCs and open education resources are not really mainstreamed at universities. And they see, the, see it more like post-traditional online higher education. They have in this report, which is available as a PDF on the net, Sir John Daniel from Academic Partnerships. Um, they have uh, really raised a lot of questions, and maybe not that many answers in the report, but there's a lot of question how, questions how to deal with quality. Uh, I think those of you who have listened to me earlier, um, I have shown, used to show this slide talking about quality uh, because this is a, was a project which was launched by um, FQL, which is a European Organization for Quality in uh, Online Learning. And we did last year a project on um, uh, MOOC and quality. And we asked um, those people who have been, uh, one, been pioneers, as uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Downs, as, as uh, Dave Cormier, as uh, Gwendy Connell, as um, Paul Stacey, as uh, Wayne McIntosh, etc. And also a student, uh, that is that uh, young, girl, young boy, and actually he's from Lund at my university. And uh, we asked them to blog about uh, what is their opinion at, about quality. And we could uh, see that uh, altogether uh, those dimensions come, come up. When you talk about quality, we have to consider that we have a massive target group, and the group is very mixed. So there is just one issue, one dimension about quality. We have really to have a huge variety um, for those people who are involved. And also there are many stakeholders. Uh, the students, the course providers, uh, the universities, the, um, um, the industry, for example, the companies, uh, and also that uh, learning takes place across contexts. And uh, taking a MOOC is more self-organized, and that's what why the concept of choice-based learning came up. And it also was discussed, discussed uh, the, the need of the peer-to-peer -peer pedagogy and uh, the importance of to declare what's in the course, what's in it for me, so that the learners can take the control themselves. Um, 
all those uh, blog posts uh, were um, frequently discussed and they are uh, on the web page and we have also written some papers about it. Um, there is another organization in Europe which is called ead to u the European Association for Distance Teaching, Teaching Universities. And they have come up with, um, together with the European Commission, uh, they have come up with the, the model of Open Up Ed, because they, this is linked to the initiative, Opening Up Education. And they came up with um, those dimensions about openness to learners, digital openness, learner-centered, independent learning, media support, um, quality and focus, spectrum of diversity. And if you meet all those, uh, with the, there are a lot of underheadings uh, as well. Um, the MOOCs can come up, can, can get an open up label. So those are dimensions to think about and to consider. So where are we now? We, we know a lot about who are the participants, there are a lot of courses uh, available, and we have uh, solved all the technical or most of the technical problems, and we have um, come up with the learning analytics and the digital skills like uh, new concepts, um, very much uh, due to the, the MOOCs. Uh, so now we have the human issues, and that is very much about attitudes, changing and to change mindset. Um, going beyond the books is to understand and to consider that we need to have other kind of attitudes to teaching and learning and education because MOOCs are not the same as traditional uh, education. Of course it will not um, substitute each other because most of the MOOCs are like five to ten weeks and um, the university courses are mainly three or four or five years or even more. Um, during this um, EMUC summit in February, which I mentioned, uh, the European uh, EMUC stakeholder summit, uh, they came up during the sessions um, a plethora of new terms. Now there are spooks, nooks, sooks, books, uh, books, uh, p mooks, uh, dooks, uh, etc. Um, and um, this is also a consequence from mooks. As we saw in one of the first slides, every letter is negotiable. So uh, is a mook open or is it more closed or is it uh, still a mook if it's just 100 people? Um, uh, are, the, are the MOOCs yeah, really reaching uh, in, in the international um, uh, public or are they just uh, for national use? Uh, the SOOCs and the books, are they small or are they very large? Um, many MOOCs are nowadays for, for corporate training, like uh, the cooks, <laughs> and for vocational training, like the books. Um, and now they, um, so uh, what are we really talking about? I mean, um, are we always talking about MOOCs or are we talking about, uh, for example, those or some, maybe some something else which are developing? And um, I am sure at least that uh, we will see a lot of new things in, in the years to come. And uh, the nice thing with, it, with this is that MOOCs have lit the fire that will not uh, soon go out. And that was also the word from the European Commissioner, um, Xavier, which I mentioned in the beginning. Oh, sorry? And this one. Uh, and also MOOCs um, um, stimulate and facilitate, facilitate uh, mobile learning. And that is also important, uh, talking about quality, because uh, most people are now taking courses uh, to their uh, uh, mobile device or with their iPad or something. And is it really um, feasible to take a course and to to take advantage of the, the, the course design on the other kind of devices than computers. 
I think I saw a study some time ago, uh, some months ago, that um, half of uh, the students are using uh, mobile devices for the studies, like iP iPad and the mobiles. Uh, they say that, um, that was in Europe. Uh, we are already used to that um, everything take place in one house, like this, like a university. The students come in, uh, the content is there, the guidance is there, the assessment is there, the certification is there, the research is there. Uh, that is uh, how it is uh, like in most countries in the world. Uh, IPTS, which is a research institute uh, for the European Commission in Europe, uh, they say that... Um, They say that uh, this will change uh, dramatically. Okay. This slide, and there are some dollar signs, and that means that. Um, uh, like, um, that uh, is the learning um, initiated by the learners, or is it uh, initiated by uh, external uh, sets? Is it guided learning, or is it uh, self guided learning? Um, then we have different kinds of um, how the the content and research and the guidance, etc., are organized. Uh, in the lower uh, part of this um, this slide, uh, there are some dollar signs, and that means that um, are people paying for education, or is it really free of charge, like in the upper level? And that is also a question how we organize education. Now that is this is really a consequence about uh, about the MOOCs. Uh, so this uh, IPTS uh, institute, they say that um, in 2030, maybe it will uh, look like this, that we have guidance, assessment, certification, um, research in uh, different um, buildings or different uh, settings, and uh, the MOOCs are in different um, ways uh, uh, organized to, to content providers, for example, or to guidance, or and the students are going their own pathways uh, here and there, uh, whatever they are needed. So they go in and out in the house as such at the, at the university, or the other providers who provide content and provide certification, for example. From um, institutional perspective, so why spend the time on the MOOCs and OER, open educational resources? Um, we need to do that because we need to, to look at uh, what's in it from the individual perspective. It is the learner who decide where they take the studies, where and what kind of studies. It's not any longer just the universities who offer the courses and the content. From institutional perspective, uh, uh, MOOCs and the are very much about the marketing and the internationalization and uh, recruiting the other students, new students. Um, both on national and global level, uh, it makes sense if there can be a higher reach out and cooperation because we can't afford any longer to do everything ourselves. That each university should have every single course themselves. We need to co collaborate. Uh, both due to personalization, sustainability, and um, to collaborate, to compete, and for lifelong learning perspectives, and of course to get the best of the best. So the question is, uh, what's in it for me? It is the individual who choose. And that is very much about mobility, uh, about collaboration, about openness, personalization, and quality again. So we have to think, uh, that is also really what we have to think about uh, going beyond the MOOCs. What's in it for me, for the individual? Why should I study just the course from Lund University instead of someone from India, from Brazil, from wherever it is? That means that we really have to attract uh, the best students and we have to collaborate with other universities to get the best of the best. Um, 
um, education will be and learning will be very much like uh, finding the, the, in, the individual's uh, own stones to step on and to take their own pathways. Maybe one course in Sweden, maybe one course in Brazil. So delegates from um, Venezuela and from Poland and so maybe they, they take courses like they, the young students today step on their own stones and they choose them themselves. And we need to provide uh, settings for them. Uh, so uh, then I will, in the end, uh, raise uh, three questions uh, beyond the MOOCs. So what key policy issues does openness pose for institution, institutions? And do institutional quality practices need to change? And will openness change the spending priorities of institutions? I think those um, three questions are really important. Uh, for universities, for stakeholders, for individuals uh, to raise for the future. So, thank you very much. so maybe I would like to stop here and we can either discuss those questions or we can discuss questions. Thank you so uh, much, um, Dr. Dr. Like, Ebert. That Michelle was uh, very, very inspirational. It got us um, chatting away there. <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of that. So as an analysis at the beginning, um, that's um, key to get everyone um, that I, or I used to, thinking to, to and um, this, discussing. Uh, caring, sharing, so caring, are there any caring. questions or and further comments? Really much oh, Cheryl is here too. So Good to see. Thank you very much. Um, um, you can get the mic if you're interested in um, voicing your comments or questions. Just let me know and I'll pass on the mic to you. It's always nice to uh, hear um, the human touch, which is uh, a voice in the chat or even a uh, webcam. So, okay, Brian, let me uh, pass on the uh, microphone to you. Um, and I see that, Teresa, you've also raised your hand. Oh, Brian, you don't have a microphone. I guess that was a mistake. <laughs> I thought you had a microphone. I see that you don't. So um, feel free to use the chat then. There's a question there by Anna. Anna's from Poland, I believe. And the question is, um, are you at Eden? She's asking you, Eba. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I will be there at the Eden conference next week in Zagreb. And, um as I said in my introduction, I'm also very, very pleased and very honored that I was um, getting the award, the, the Eden Fellow Award for 2014, and uh, the ceremony will be next week as well. Congratulations. Thank you, we see each other there, we see each other there Anna. So. Congratulations on the award. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I will be there for the Eden Conference uh, next week. Uh, there's a Cyprus. comment there by Teresa. And, the universities um, here do offer online I'm courses. Very, very pleased, uh, very that many I was, choose um, to mix the two online uh, and face-to-face. The uh, the uh, no uh, Eva, what do you think about the future of the universities? You know, in the United States, well. many universities have closed so, down uh, their doors. A lot of my colleagues are crying out, Nelly, help, I need a job. And I keep hearing this. I've been oh, hearing this for much. a number of years. I just found out that a university in Kentucky is also closing up. Colleges are closing down. There aren't enough students enrolling. This is the United States. Uh, I don't know what's happening in Europe. But do you think that maybe universities just can't afford to stay offline? They have to go online or just students aren't going to join? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I think, uh, like uh, this study from IPTS, for example, in Europe, that uh, maybe we can't do anything in house any longer. I mean, for example, in Sweden, we have some 45 universities. If it are fit to implement it, 
yeah, I think uh, I really think they have. I mean, they have to go online because I mean they have to. We we need blended learning. I mean, even even at university, even on campus, we need to be more have more digitization. Uh, but also, I think, uh, like uh, this study from IPTS, for example, in Europe, that um, maybe we can't do anything in house any longer. I mean, for example, in Sweden, we have some 45 universities. Maybe there are 15 too many, <laughs> at least. I mean, why, why, how can you afford that all universities should have the same introduction course in, uh, in uh, science, for example? I mean, is it really affordable? I think um, that's the reason no, why those uh, NOOCs, for example, national on, op, open online courses, yeah, but uh, I think are quite not, interesting they can't afford because the maybe the on some courses really we can really not collaborate. Not can afford it. There's a question and here from Andrea. I would like to know, can really uh, focus on what Dr. Ebba, really your personal on. views on what can be done in the States, to reduce the massive dropout rates but, on um, MOOCs. Some, course, some universities have closed down some of the courses, and they take them um, as MOOCs instead, and then they can concentrate their budget and their time and their energy on what they really, really are good in and what they are specialized in. And I think we will see more about that in the future. Yes, I think we can do a lot. First, I don't think it's a failure if there is a dropout, because the failure is that we, we measure the MOOCs with the same kind of system as we do with ordinary courses, and that is a really a failure. <laughs> uh, that is the first thing. Uh, the second thing is um, that, um, uh, like came up in, in the uh, in the MOOC pro project, for example, from FQL, and also the MOOCs I've taken myself, and the experience I have that if the learner really should, uh, and that is, I mean, we, we see the same with distance education. I mean, if the learner really shall take the, the responsibility for their own learning, they really need to know already from the beginning what is expecting from them and how they can nav navigate in the course. Um, so the course really need to be transparent, ordered from the beginning. And there are some uh, key issues, for example, transparency, uh, flexibility, interactivity, um, personalization, um, learning pathways. Uh, we, we know the quality issues, and if, but I'm not quite sure if they are really, really always built in into the MOOCs. So that is one reason why the MOOCs fail. Because um, what I have seen so far, I mean, I, I and discuss and discuss with people, and also research shows that sometimes um, those quality issues are not really well uh, embedded in the MOOCs um, because it's so much other things to to think about. Um, building a MOOC. Um, I can say just a very um, simple example. Uh, we are go going to, to launch MOOCs now in autumn and in, at my university and last week I had, a, I had a seminar with my colleagues about quality. Uh, more or less than those kind of things which I have discussed with you about, and especially from the uh, Open Up Ed uh, model from EDTU. to you. And I could really see the people, oh, shall we think about that too? Oh, now it's starting to be complicated. <laughs> Uh, because they were, you know, they were so upset, um, uh, yeah. concentrated about filming and producing. I mean, producing. And I say we, we need to think about that before we produce something, because it's too late afterwards. Um, so I think um, the design and the the quality issues we have to start to think about already from the beginning. And if the quality will be better, I don't think either we will have that kind of dropout because some people drop out because it's too boring. That is what I have done myself, and I think you have maybe the same kind of experiences. But on the other hand, I mean, is it really a failure if I start, for example, in one course, and then I find, oh, this was maybe not exactly something for me. And then suddenly I 
see something yes, else which you I know, want there's so many things similar, involved but maybe with and another what design, I find maybe disturbing and I've added that to the attractive, chat attractive is the fact for me that and more, um, higher education so that never expected their professors, for that their instructors and so on to know anything about teaching but first of all, and we have specifically the learning. Kind of Unless they're psychologists who study we, learning, we most uh, instructors at higher education do not know anything about teaching. It's not a question of they just kind of lecture. And maybe they're good speakers, maybe they're boring speakers. Mm -hmm. But learning is certainly not about lecturing, and we know that today as a result of technology. What I'm wondering about high school teachers and elementary school teachers, kindergarten teachers, know more about instruction and learning than these professors. So why don't we bring everybody into the equation? Why don't we bring psychologists who study learning, who know how the brain, who've done brain scans and MRIs like Richard Davidson? Why don't we bring these experts into the equation and have them uh, discuss what it takes for a learner to bring a learner into the yeah. learning process and get them motivated and so on. Why are we using popular people who started the MOOCs like Richard, like George Siemens? I know George personally, I have nothing against him, but he doesn't know anything about instruction and learning. He's not an expert in that area. He may be an expert in giving MOOCs, but he's not an expert in pedagogy or androgyny. He's not. So what I'm finding difficult to comprehend is why are we going in circles instead of you know getting to the point which is how do we get students engaged in learning and not in test taking and so on yeah. now i know you agree with that otherwise i wouldn't say it because i usually keep this to myself <laughs> yes, i mean i think that is also something which we need to change mm -hmm. i mean it is so much about attitudes and, and values but i think we need to work much more in teams for example when we are in the courses, mm -hmm. because um, in the academics they have their subject and knowledge and research, etc. Then they need to be uh, industrial, uh, more instructional designers and learning designers and uh, libraries. Yeah, yes, I totally agree with you. So we need to, to work much more in teams, especially. Mm -hmm. in uh, and, uh, <laughs> and I think also, I mean, I think it, that is also something we, we need to change. I mean, it is very much about attitudes and, and values. And I think we need exactly. to work. Much more and, and somebody mentioned the heart, you know, where is the heart? The heart in all this, you know, the effective part of it, the, you know, the emotional aspect of learning in a social environment. Librarians, etc. So we need to work much more in teams, and especially if we're going to produce MOOCs. Because it's not just to, to have, a, have a lecture on the video, that is, I mean, that is uh, not a thing at all. Yes, many of those teachers who hate to teach. Uh, but the reason they hate to teach, um, from the ones that I've uh, encountered, this might be interesting research, is because some they are don't want to teach to the test. Uh, this so is what's going on in the United States today. I'm Canadian, but I still know what's going on in the States with the Common Core and the fact that they don't want to teach the test. And, and the whole idea of testing, you know, until we decide what we're doing with testing, uh, it's going to be very hard to move from step one to step two. Yes, I think that is also really beyond the MOOCs because we need to change the assessment system. Exactly. Look at the chat. Okay, I think that's that's what it's all about. It's about learning through this kind of discussion. Yes, I think you know, that where is one also person really or two people speak and everybody the, else the, the is uh, having a discussion. The, the Do you see that, Ebba? <laughs> Most assessments today is just to learn, I mean, to learn by heart and then to learn a lot of, uh, about facts. There's also a um, lot of new things to think about. Um, maybe the, the certification is not enough. I mean, only the, the only thing that getting a badge in, like in the um, employer 
is uh, decide if the person is good enough or not to work mm. that much or not. Yeah, see, so I look at the chat. That is really, really a new uh, way of thinking. Exactly. And then also, it's maybe we haven't discussed the information, that uh, too not much, but uh, with this the information um, and match, being tested um, on. I mean, where match. on the job do you There's have to learn things by heart? A lot of except new maybe things to fly to think a plane about. or something technical. Uh, maybe the the certification is not uh, enough. I am only the, the only thing, but getting a badge and letting the em employers uh, decide if the person is good enough or not to work at that, that company. That is really, really a new uh, way of thinking. Um, uh, I want to say. And that is already happening that uh, that uh, more and more employers are um, uh, taking their, their employees and they have their their personal portfolio and they're coming with the different kind of batches which which they have uh, collected uh, yes elsewhere I think that's the key of the CMOOCs the George Siemens uh, made so there's a lot of so things to change incredibly and to obvious rethink. I mean the, the idea that we do need to um, connect for learning. It's, it's up to, to us. This, uh, right, some perspective. That, that was the point, um, that it's up to uh, the anywhere, learners everywhere, to from anyone, find the way uh, and the people that will portfolio. bring them to the next level. And also to, to learn to network, that is important. For the, the right. Well, there's a lot of things to think about, uh, Dr. Ebba. I want to thank you um, for getting us started here, getting us on this discussion. And uh, there, Tom has uh, added the link for everyone to join the discussion. I mean, we the discussion doesn't yes, end I mean, uh, with the end of the presentation it's, it's, um, it goes on and that's what's wonderful that um, Dr. Ebba has got his thinking about so many different that, venues and that's why I enjoy your, your uh, presentation so much because um, you know y y your ideas get us thinking about other ideas you, which bring other ideas so it's got a wonderful ripple effect so do you see the link uh, there everyone um, Okay, so click on that and let's continue um, with the discussions at our own time. It's not time-based. So uh, you can add a question there, your thoughts, uh, share some links perhaps uh, that were not included in the chat box. In addition, you can uh, copy the chat. You can do that as well, Ebba. I'm sure you weren't able to uh, get everything. Do you see the copy chat there? So if you could, yes, copy the chat and then you can add it anywhere. Take a look at it and see some of the points. I'm sure you'll find them uh, very interesting. And we can continue the discussions through them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to MOOC 5 as well. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Um, let me see. Yes, that's